Father, we uh, come together and we greet you because we know you were here waiting for us because you knew each one of us were coming. Thank you for calling us that we might get closer to you. And I thank you for each of these who have responded today, that they would answer that call. Lord, as we're here, we are going to study your word, your truths, the ones you inspired James to be able to leave for us in your holy scriptures. So we sit at your feet today as your students, ask for your Holy Spirit to speak to each one of us, drawing us into your circle that we might better be able to be your people in this world. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. We ended up uh, talking about adultery um, last week and um, identified the enemies that, that James had named um, as we are um, trying to live out these, these new lives. And he said the world and the flesh and the devil were the enemies that we were um, facing. So as he named them, he then begins to, and we're um, going to begin in verse 5 today, James chapter 4, verse 5. He begins to um, show us how we can answer these enemies in our lives. So that's where we're picking up this morning. The first one is the world. Now he just talked about that um, and we mentioned it last week, verse 4. So we're starting with verse 5, but let's go back to verse 4. So, man, I might even be able to do that. Hold on here. There we go. It says, adulterers, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. So, um, what's, what's the easy solution then to that problem from James' perspective? Don't be a friend with the world. The world, the flesh, and the devil. All right? And what that brings to our attention is this reality of so we have this reality that we live in this dual reality it's a physical reality and it's a spiritual reality we we are made living in created in two realities and our growth and development as as human beings is when we are able to um, recognize the second reality that's not obvious to us Ob the obvious reality is a physical reality. That's what um, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians. When I was a child, you know, I thought like a child. Well, what does that mean? Well, when we're, when we're first in this world, what are we thinking? We're thinking about the physical world, the physical reality. All right? But as we mature, we learn, no, there's another reality. There's a spiritual reality to this. And so we need to begin, when I was a man, I put away childish things. Right? So that's the graduation as we grow and mature that we're able to recognize the, actually the dominance of the spiritual in our creation, in our lives. So if we're friends with the world, well, we probably have our focus in the wrong place you know, because the spiritual is lasting forever and the physical is going to pass away so friends with the world what does that mean that means pursuing relationships as an answer um, trying to uh, accumulate the world's materials um, buying into the world's morals or the truths that the world would offer us as opposed to what God offers us um, in our 
and our hearts and our in our spiritual our new creation in our hearts. And here's the reason why this is so important. God is a jealous God. We don't talk about that much in the church. I don't know that I ever really heard that from the pulpit that when I was growing up. Um, it's kind of a one of those realities that, you know, it was just more comfortable not to talk about that. James chapter 5, or excuse me, verse 5. <clears throat> James chapter 4, beginning with verse 5. Or do you suppose that it is for nothing that the scripture says God yearns jealously? For the spirit that he has made to dwell in us. But he gives all the more grace. Therefore it says God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. So let's move on for a second here and we'll see if we can't wrap all of this up. Let's look at the flesh. What does James say about the flesh? The world, the flesh, and the devil. The flesh. James says we need, in the flesh, we need to cultivate a humble heart before God. Where do we get that? We don't get that from the world. We get that from our spiritual nature and reality. Why do we want to do that? Because God is gracious to those who will worship him above all other things. When we reach the point where we have a priority that we know that God, God is above all other, thing, all other things. And so when we mature to that point, God rewards us. God is a jealous God. In fact, one of the Amazing things um, we learn from scriptures is that God, God uses that word as his name. My name is jealous, God says. Let's look at that a little bit, Old Testament. So that's already significant, right? This concept of God being a jealous God going all the way back to the Old Testament and Moses. Hello. Moses, Exodus chapter 20. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of their fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. And that's something that's a little unnerving. This is a little bit of an aside. That's something that's a little unnerving right now. Because we're, <clears throat> we're following in the order of Europe and, and the UK. In Europe and the UK right now, less than 10% of those populations worship God. Less than 10%. Less than 10%. All right? So we are quickly approaching that. I read an article just uh, two days ago that talked about the United Methodist Church being so upset about the 7,200 churches that have disaffiliated so far. You know? And uh, the comment was, well, what about being worried about the 75,000 churches that are probably going to leave or, excuse me, are probably going to um, close in the next three years. Right. Think about that. Yep. So, and where am I going with that? I'm, I'm going with that to when you abandon God, when you hate God, when you turn your back on God, when you decide God's not important anymore, what does it say here? That, that's just chilling. 
It says, God punishes the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. We don't escape. God will not be mocked. Exodus 34, chapter 34, is where we really get the, the place where God makes it crystal clear. Do not worship any other God, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Wow. The name of God is pretty important. Remember that? I am who I am. When Moses asked for the name and, and uh, the, the, uh, the name for the, the, in it, in it, with the Hebrew people, they wouldn't, even, they wouldn't even speak the name of God out loud. The name of God's a pretty significant thing. And here we learn it. His name is Jealous. So you think, okay, what, how do you put that together? What does that mean? I mean, Jealous, for us, in our culture, our language, jealous is just, that's tough to, to take that word and associate it with God. So let's work through this a little bit. And to do that, I want us to look at the first four of the Ten Commandments. <coughs> I'm going to read from the, there's two accounts of the Ten Commandments, one in Exodus and one in, in Deuteronomy. I'm reading the one from Exodus. Beginning, uh, this is chapter 20. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything, in heaven above or in the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. So right, right there in the Ten Commandments, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. So, right there we learn a thousand generations. Is that, is that literal? Well, of course not. Right? So, is at that point now you back up and say, so is the third and fourth generation? No. You know, uh, literal, a literal, no. But what is, what is it, what does it boil down for us? God's not going to forget the sins of the people who turn against me, and God will greatly reward those people who are turning toward me and who will love me. By those who love me and keep my commandments, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. So you see, all, all of those um, initial commandments were all about putting God in the place where God deserves to be. Because there is no one else that can rival God. And so when we put someone else in that place, God doesn't appreciate that. Remember we've talked about the Shema in here, and... Um, and how that's, um, that was what was written in the little mezuzahs and in the phylacteries that they put on their foreheads and, and things. And, and there was some instruction after the Shema. Let me read some of that instruction to you now. It comes from Deuteronomy 6. Fear the Lord your God, serve him only, and take your oaths in his name. Do not follow other gods the gods of the peoples around you. For the Lord your God who is among you is a jealous God and his anger will burn against you and he will destroy you from the face of the land. So once again, you know, even though we haven't really in the church looked at this really seriously, this concept of God being a jealous God ties into 
this whole covenant issue that we do talk about. We do like to talk about covenants and God being a, a covenant-making God and we living in covenants, the Old Testament covenant, the first covenant, and now with Jesus Christ, the new covenant, the second covenant that God makes. So covenants are pretty important in this whole um, scheme of things. And so that brings us back to, I think, in, in a wonderful way, it ties into, well, what's the purpose of this covenant? What, what are we doing with, with covenant making and covenants? I will be your God, and you will be my people. Where do we use that today, that, that concept? Where do we use that promise-making concept today? In marriage. I will be your husband. You will be my wife. And what is, there's a covenant promise there. It's an exclusive type of a, a relationship, a promise that we're making. That's, and this is why adultery comes back into the picture here with God later on. I mean, these covenants are crucial to our understanding about who God is and how we relate to God. Faithfulness is the expectation to those covenants. And God always claims, I have always been faithful. Mm, what about y'all? <laughs> you know, and, and so that's when he gets, and you can see now, you can begin to see where this jealousy comes in. Well, wait a minute. We, the Spirit of God, which the pneuma, the Holy Spirit, dwelling in us is for the express purpose of continuing to draw us to God, to bring us alongside God. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. <clears throat> that, that's what we're doing this morning. I mean, that, that Holy Spirit in us, drawing us to worship, drawing us to other Christians, drawing us into Christian fellowship, drawing us into Bible studies, what's that for? Well, it's not to make us better. No, that's not to put us above anybody else. Well, I, I go to Bible study once a week, or I go to worship, you know, once once a week, every Sunday. No. What is, what is the, why is the Holy Spirit doing that? The Holy Spirit's doing that to draw us closer to God. So we have a more intimate relationship with God. So what happens? Basically, our human nature and pride will outweigh the influence of the Holy Spirit. We become proud. We decide, you know, well, God maybe isn't all that important. And this, I really would like to do this, or I, you know, this, this kind of makes sense to me, or, you know, and so we begin to pull away from making God the be-all, end-all, and, and again, I'm trying to just make connections here, that's exactly what happened to Lucifer at the very beginning, what started all the problems, what, he wanted to be like God. He was jealous. He thought, you know what? I can do that. I can be like that. I, I want that. So, so he ended up, you know, being cast out of heaven. So when we have that pride, when we build that pride up and, and we not end up, don't putting God in the place where God's supposed to be, we don't yield to God. In fact, we, we kind of even maybe turn against and rebel against God, God, God has to butt up again. We're, we know that. We're parents. I mean, when your child's not doing the right thing, you've got to come up against the child. So we, another way we talk about this, and, and we have looked at that, is the idea about being dependent or independent. You know, we, in this culture in particular, and probably, generally, the attitude of the world is, hey, I am my own man. I make my choices. I make my decisions. 
I'll pick myself up by the bootstraps. If it's up, if it's going to be, it's up to me. And so we tend to have this independent attitude, and, um, and that's especially strong in men. Right? And, and I believe that has great impact on why in most Christian circles, there are more women than there are men. And I would give this morning as an example. Right? So, and that's not to pass judgment. That's just, just, we're just trying to identify. We're just trying to see the reality here as the scriptures show it to us. Right? We weren't made to be independent. We were created to be dependent. The image of God is in us. Everything that's, that's of value to us has been given to us from God, put there on purpose. We're, no, we're not independent. We didn't create ourselves. We, we can't do really anything that's meaningful in and of and by ourselves. It comes from God. So learn to be dependent on God. <clears throat> there was a show I used to watch when I was a young boy called Father Knows Best. It was a cute show. Probably if I were to watch it today, I'd think it was just ridiculous. But anyway, the reality is that's the truth. Our Heavenly Father knows best. So our first inclination should always be to go to our Heavenly Father and seek from Him what is best for us. None of us know how many hairs are on our heads, but our Heavenly Father does. He knows our thoughts even as we think them. He understands why we feel the way we feel. I mean, so with a humble heart, you know, God, not that God needs that, but that that's the way God has designed us. Our best interest is to turn to our Heavenly Father and ask what's best. Now, Peter quotes the same passage as, as James is quoting here. He says, And all of you must clothe yourselves with humility in your dealings with one another, for God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. All right. So, overcoming our pride giving up our independence, putting God in first place, and turning to Him. That's the issue here. Verse 7, chapter 4. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So, in these next verses, starting with this verse, verse 7, James names six action verbs in order to help us fight the conflict that comes from the world, um, the flesh, and the devil. And this first verb that he uses right here is this idea about submission, submitting. Actually, it's a military term. It means recognized proper rank and we all know in the military how significant rank is and what the expectation is as you go up or go down the ranks and what's the concept here for James as he talks to us about this is recognizing where God ranks God is like up at the very top he's like the point of the pyramid so we need to rank God there, and we need to recognize that, no, we're not up at the top of the pyramid. We never will be. So get that. Submit to that. Surrender to that. All right? You are not independent of God. You are not equal to God. Can't be, won't be. He is of the superior rank. And this whole idea about submission and the problem we have with submission, I'm not going into that. My gosh, we could spend the rest of the Bible, this particular Bible study talking about that. I have, 
kind of addressed that a little bit in our um, Thursday Here I Stand teachings. I have talked about that, so um, I'm going to let that stand as it is. Here we're just going to remember that James <clears throat> has already addressed this issue, if you remember, in, as he contrasted the work of um, believers as opposed to demons. Remember what he said about demons? Demons know who God is. They just don't submit to him. Well, okay. I mean, th there's the problem. There's the issue. It's not just good enough to know who God is. You have got to humble yourselves and be able to submit to God in order to be in the right rank, the right relationship. Living under the authority of God's word and God's rank has two parts to it. First of all, you have to submit to God. And then second, you have to resist the one who is against God or Satan. All right? So, verse 7, submit yourselves to God, resist the devil, he will flee from you. So, the devil, Satan, the evil one, we are not to yield, we are to resist, we are to turn away from, we need to be smart about the evil one and his presence with his um, um, demons in, in our lives. So here's, here's a reality check again. There's a good number of people, especially in the liberal side of the theological spectrum, who question and quite, quite often deny the reality of Satan, considered to be a metaphor, something to help us understand better, not a real personality. I personally don't know how you can read the scriptures and escape the fact that Jesus considered Satan to be a real person and the New Testament writers considered Satan to be a real person. Now, they don't have flesh and blood, but they have a personality because God created them with that. They have a personhood. And they have free choice like we do. So, again, recognizing that spiritual reality, accepting that spiritual reality, and what that means is a big part of our maturing as we grow as children of God. I mean, there is a spiritual reality. There is a spiritual warfare going on in this world that we can either be blind to or we can open ourselves up to so that we can be part of the solution and not part of the problem. <clears throat> the devil is constantly trying to seduce us to join in the rebellion against God using our pride and our self-centeredness in our hearts. What was the first thing he said to Eve? You won't die. You'll just be like God. God doesn't want that. But what is that if that's not seeking a higher rank than what we really have? I mean, this all ties together. It all, it, all, it all holds. I mean, the scriptures are just incredible the more you study them. I had a, um, I can't remember his name right now, but I was privileged to, to sit at a couple lectures with a, a well-known New Testament um, scholar back in the 70s. <laughs> and um, he came up with a, a, a uh, a phrase that I never forgot. 
It stuck with me all these years. He says, you have to be smart enough to glance at the devil. Meaning, out of the corner of your eye, you've got to know where he is and what he's doing. You get, you pay attention. You know, is he coming at you from here? Is he coming at you from over there? What's he doing? What's he stirring up over there? You know, you've got to be smart enough to glance at the devil. But you have to gaze at Jesus. <laughs> What's that mean? Your focus, your attention, your, your, your whole being is tied into, well, where's Jesus? What's Jesus doing? If, if you're not doing that, you can't, you can't follow someone you're gazing at, or excuse me, glancing at. You can only follow someone you're gazing at. So there's, there's that portion of that. All right. <clears throat> um, James chapter 4 verse 8 moving on with these verbs now draw near to God and he will draw near to you cleanse your hands you sinners purify your hearts you double minded lament and mourn and weep let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy into dejection. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. So the third verb here is to draw near to God. It's an obvious spiritual reference since God is not a physical entity and we don't have idols. This is another one of the issues with idols with God. Right? So that's clearly a spiritual maturity thing. This is calling us to God's holiness. Right? As we draw near to God, we're entering into his, holy, um, his holiness. And, and if we're not holy, that's not going to be a good thing for us. So in um, a fascinating thing here in the Gospel of John, chapter 14, Jesus talks about sending the Holy Spirit. And the word he uses there for the Holy Spirit is paraclete. And the verb from that, you know, as we know, sometimes there's nouns and verbs. The verb for that is paracleto, which is what the Holy Spirit's job, the paraclete's job is, Parakleo is the one who calls us alongside. The paraclete is one who calls. And parakleo, the verb for that, is the one who is calling us alongside of God. So Jesus even names the Holy Spirit as that comforter or advocate in our lives. Drawing near. Call us to draw us near Alongside God. Next verb is cleanse. To cleanse ourselves of sin. Now this immediately, as he says this, for the Jewish people, ties them into the Old Testament rituals. There, there were numerous Old Testament rituals for cleansing and cleanliness. Especially for the priests which was the whole, the whole deal, the whole, um, about the basin of sea, you know, that was in front of the tabernacle. What was that for? That was only for the priests to purify themselves, cleanse themselves before they went into the holy place. Why? Because God's holy and you can't be anything impure or dirty there. So in this case, what is James asking us to do? He's asking us to stop being double-minded. I mean, for him, holiness means purity. So if we're, if we're double-minded, if we're straddling the fence, if we're lukewarm, well, then we're not pure. We, we've, got some, we've got some issues going on. And, and so we need to cleanse ourselves of that. Cleansing is how we actually draw near. You know, we physically wash our hands all the time, regularly, so that we don't carry germs and, and we are, live a healthier life. Well, 
Spiritually, it's the same thing. So how do we cleanse ourselves spiritually? Well, we do that on a daily basis with confession. That's what confession's all about. Because if we confess our sins, what does he promise to do? Forgive our sins. That's just like being washed. And now we're clean again. Right? So the cycle that we have of confession and repentance, which then leads us into a profession of faith and a dedication and a consecration, we're constantly in that circle, traveling that circle over and over again. Why? So that we can be as pure as possible while we're living in these bodies. There's a day coming when we will be pure, pure. We'll, we'll be white. We'll be as bright and as light as we can be in the next reality. Right now, not. Not so much. Why? Because we're not sold out. Somehow we simply can't sell out. There's always some some portion of pride or some portion of selfishness that's holding on. And, and, and so I'm not com really under the full authority of God. I still hold a little place for myself there. You know, I'm still proud at some place. You know, my heart is not always broken by the things that break God's heart. So I got an issue. I got a, a, that's why I have to keep going through that cycle and circle, which is exactly the point that the Hebrews writer was making for the tabernacle and the temple here on earth. You got to do it time after time after time again. Why? Because the it wasn't you weren't made pure, pure. What? That's why Christ only had to do it once, because he entered into the the tabernacle in heaven. And so now, that's it. That's, that's holy, complete holiness, complete pureness. Which is why, again, you know, that's not going to happen to us until we get there. Next verb. Lament, mourn, and weep at our rebellious inclinations. Recognize the fact that we have, uh, we have this propensity to not not bow down and worship God as as uh, the top priority in all of our of our actions and words you know don't be satisfied and proud with what you want the things that, that you like you know we have to take seriously this idea about sin we have a hard time doing that in our human, our human lives. Sin is just completely unacceptable to God. So there's part of this difference in our rank and, and, and you know, God just cannot abide with sin. And we participate in it, which again is why that circle is so important of confession and repentance and forgiveness and and then we consecrate ourselves, and then uh, now we messed up again. We want to stay in right relationship with God until we get to the point where we will always be in a right relationship with God. We have to take sin seriously. And here's one of the biggest deceptions in our lives. <clears throat> allow ourselves to be talked into a certain complacency about sin. Yeah, we know that murder, oh man, I would never murder someone, you know, or maybe stealing, I couldn't possibly steal something. Um, committing adultery, I, no, that, that's out of the question for me. But it's like the letter of the law. If you just miss one part, then actually you've, you've committed the sin that separates you from God. Each one of us, it's just our human nature. It's not, not anything that I'm, I'm 
deriding us about, each one of us have gotten comfortable with a certain level of sin. And I can deal with that. I know I shouldn't do that, but I can deal with that. And, and let me give you some examples of what I'm talking about. And, and again, this isn't to make anyone feel bad. It's just to recognize this is our human plight. This, this, is, how, this is how we're living. We laugh at things we shouldn't laugh at. We watch things we shouldn't watch. We go places we shouldn't go. I mean, we've simply decided that some things just aren't that bad. It's okay. I, I, can, I can deal with that. I'm not going to do these. But I'm, you know, this isn't that bad. And, and how do we get there? We get there by comparing ourselves to other people in the world. We don't compare ourselves to the angels. We're comparing ourselves to other people in the world. See, now where are we? We're back to that physical, spiritual reality stuff again. And when we allow ourselves to be enveloped in the physical and we lose track of the spiritual, well, then we can fall into that. But if we were to compare ourselves to God's pure holiness or the, or the, the, the righteousness of Gabriel, well, now, now we're on the short end of the stick. Oh, gosh, that's not so good. So, the accusation is accurate. We're adulterers. And that's really hard for God. I mean, he's, he's doing the best he can with that. Adultery is such a great example because when a spouse physically in this world, a marriage spouse, is unfaithful, That's a really difficult thing. It takes, it takes a really special couple to be able to recover from that and go on to, to live a, a good relationship. So imagine that one spouse has committed adultery against the other spouse, and they come together and they try to, they try to reconcile, but the spouse that committed adultery said this, you know, I agree that I'm going to be true to you most of the time, but but every now and then, probably I'm going to slip away and be with someone else. Is that going to be okay over here? No. And that's where God is. That's why this is so tough for God. That's why it's so important for us to belong to this, this circle of confession and repentance and dedication and consecration and commitment. I want you to also see how the other promise that God makes to us in this covenant becomes so important here. What does God promise us? I am with you always. So it's not like as if a spouse got left alone spouse was deserted, a spouse was under the impression that the other person was gone, and so they have a relationship with someone else. No. God says, I am with you always. No reason to commit adultery. So, James is saying, hey, we need to look at this. We need to fix this. And it's all about ourselves. Why? Because we certainly can't fix someone else in that situation. We have no influence over somebody else. When, when James is saying to fix this, he's, he's talking about my heart. I can point this out to you, but I have nothing to do with your hearts. My heart is the one i got to deal with. Last verb. Humble yourself before God. 
So, that's the idea of being able to make a confession. That's the difference between the evil one and the Holy Spirit. Because guilt has, a, has two sides to it. You can use guilt as manipulation. You can make someone feel guilty. Right? And the evil one does that all the time. You know you're not good enough. You, you know God can't possibly. You know what you did. You, you really, you're not loving at all. And so the evil one begins laying that guilt trip on us. And I've said before, and I'll remind us again, when we feel guilty, right, we've violated somebody, are we, are we quick to go be close to that person? Or are we have a tendency to kind of avoid that person? You see, that's exactly what the evil one's trying to accomplish in our lives. That we feel guilty, and so we're going to avoid God. You see how that comes together? What's the Holy Spirit do? The Holy Spirit never puts us on a guilt trip. The Holy Spirit always convicts us. What does that mean? The Holy Spirit brings the truth to our mind. Do you remember you did this? Yeah, I did. Is that the right thing to do? No, it's not. I'm sorry, I did that. Bingo! What is that? Confession? Repentance? Now we're back in the circle. Okay, so now I can rededicate myself and be consecrated. I'm back in the right relationship. And so that's, that's the humbleness part of this thing. Repentance brings healing to us. We can wander away. But if we will humble ourselves, God can restore us. Remember what John says in the early scriptures. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Wow. If we say we have not sinned, we make him to be a liar, him meaning God, and his word is not in us because he makes it clear, all are sinners and fall short of the glory of God. So you see this issue that we have, this dependence, independence, this physical, this spiritual, my wants, desires, and thoughts, and God's wants, desires, and thoughts. Am I going to put myself in the right place? Whose word, whose truth am I going to live by? My own, what I think is right, what I want to be right, or God's word of truth? You know what? I think we'll just end it there today. If we, if we jump into the rest of this here, we ended those six verbs. That's a good place. That's a good place to end. So we'll pick up with verse 11 next time. So we do have a couple minutes. If anyone wants to have some kind of conversation or questions or comments or The idea about confession, let me just talk about that for a second. Because in the church, that has become one of the dividing places, our understanding about confession. As Protestants, you know, we vary just a little bit from the Roman Orthodox concept of confession. Confessions were something that needed to be made to the priest. And the priest then in his judgment as an instrument of God would assign um, prayers or acts that would lead one into God's forgiveness. So you were absolved of that. The Protestant church 
looked at that differently and yet similarly. There, clearly, we believe that there doesn't need to be any mediator between us and God for forgiveness of sins except Jesus Christ. So we don't need to go to confession. And if you have, if you have good Catholic friends, you've heard them at one time or another talk about the need to go to confession. Okay. We can, the curtain has been torn in two. There's, there's nothing that separates us from God now, so we can go straight to God with our confessions and our repentance. And we can be forgiven. There is something significant, however, in confession, to be able to speak your confession out loud to somebody else. And that's a type of um, self-awareness confession. We all have self-talk. In fact, we, we, I'm the most important person I talk to. And that's true for every one of you. Right? Our self-talk is essential to us. Right? What I say to myself is way more important than what any of you say to me. And you, you can say some really important things to me. Self-talk is important. <clears throat> but when it's all internal, unspoken, it somehow is not real. Some of the most imp dramatic moments of my life has been when I have heard myself say something. Not that I thought something, but I actually said something. When I hear myself say that to somebody else, it's like, oh, wow. So if we keep our sins bottled up inside us, and we never are vulnerable in our sin, so we never speak it, out loud, well, then it's like it's never been exposed. So, we do believe as Protestants that it is helpful, it's healthy, to be able to speak your confession out loud to somebody else's ears. Is that necessary to be forgiven? No. But is it probably important for me to recognize that I have released that sin so that I can receive God's forgiveness? Yep, probably so. So it's helpful to each of us to be able to have somebody or some people that we trust and we can share that type of relationship with. I can't do that. I mean, I can look in the mirror and speak out loud to myself, but, you know, <laughs> maybe it, it, that's where pride comes in. We're not supposed to be prideful. So, anyway, just saying, I mean, that was kind of a little aside. But Is that why? That's a little scary. I, I realize that's a little scary, but... I, is that why um, Catholics, if they don't go to confession, they can't have communion? Oh. I mean, because if they haven't... They're had... not clean. Yeah. Yeah. John Wesley did that himself, by the way. John Wesley, he, he did that through small groups and not the priesthood. All right? So you didn't have to go to the priest at a confessional, but you had to belong to a small group. And in that small group meeting, it wasn't just a, you know, how did you do, you know, how do you feel today? What, what, how, how, how's it been going for you? No, there were, there were a list of questions. And each person went over the answer to those questions to everybody else in that group. That was part of the 
method of how to live. Right? So if you did not do that, and your small group leader did not report that you had been there doing that, John Wesley would not serve you communion. He got in big trouble with that with a female <laughs> that he had special interest in one time. But that's a whole another historical uh, thing. Um, but, but yeah, that's the concept of that. I mean, the reality is, as Protestants, we say, we're just not in control of that. That's not, our, that's, that's not where we need to be. We don't need to have any human interference there. So we will serve communion to anybody, anytime they ask, they want to participate in it. We don't force it on people. But we make it clear that if you come here, it's because you are choosing to live a new life following from now on in a right relationship with Christ. You know? So you are welcome to come and receive this. So we don't step in there at all in the Protestant tradition. Well, it really seems like they're setting themselves up as a judge. Well, they are. Yeah. Although... The, the priest really isn't a judge. The priest is a, truly a mediator. You know, and that's where, you know, again, Martin Luther in his 95 Theses, which that was one of the issues on the 95 Theses, says, you know, it's not that this is totally misguided. It's just there's no scriptural basis for it. You know, <clears throat> the... The fact that they went to confession is what put them in right relationship with God. It is not that they did what the priest said to do. So the priest didn't have any power to forgive them. He just gave them something physical to offset, in his mind, to offset the sin that was confessed so that the person had, you know... The, you know, that's that worldly issue. Okay, I did this. Now I did that. Okay, now we're done. So the, the priest really wasn't performing any power, act of power in the forgiveness. It was the fact that you've been to confession. That's what was important. Because in our spiritual lives, being in confession is how we stay in right relationship with God. Well, and, and you know, that, that kind of begins to happen, you know, uh, the, in the Catholic uh, tradition, the, the priest um, was a place like you were talking about, okay, so I, I can't say that to somebody else. So the priest in his position was the one that you could say that to and know, okay, that that nobody else is going to hear this. So, you know, it wasn't, wasn't like as if we all have friends. And so we leave here and we each go to our friends and we each confess something. So now there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There's ten different people walking around with information about us. Okay, that's, that's kind of that's scary. Peggy, associated with Catholics over the years and priests, a lot of good Christian Catholics believe formal confession to a priest is a spiritual catharsis. Okay. Number two, the word priest comes from pontifex, a bridge between humans and our Heavenly Father. Right, a mediator. Yeah. Thank you, Aaron. I dug that back from years ago. <laughs> A few, huh? Thank you, Gary. <laughs> Anyone else? Anything else? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time in this day. We thank you for each person that's here. And Lord, we just uh, give, you, uh, give you ourselves. Take this information that we've learned today and, and bring it into our lives in a in a meaningful way, and now send us out from here that we can be meaningful in other people's lives. In Christ's name, amen.